In this video, I'm going to tell you everything you need to know about lipid biochemistry for a biochemistry class and for the MCAT. But something important to realize is these free fatty acids are at the center of lipid biochemistry. And these free fatty acids can be attached to two different types of backbones. We have glycerol backbones and we have sphingosine backbones. However, in order to understand lipid biochemistry, there are two organic chemistry mechanisms you should be aware of. So the first mechanism involves a hydroxyl and a carboxyl. And the key idea is that we nucleophilically attack forming a bond. And when we form a bond, we break a bond. These electrons fall on this guy and we're left with this product, with this ester. The second mechanism involves an hydroxyl and a phosphoester, where again, it's the same idea. We nucleophilically attack forming a bond. When we form a bond, we break a bond and these electrons fall on this oxygen and we're left with this phosphodiester. So these are the two mechanisms you need to be aware of. So let's quickly go over them. So first let's go over this first mechanism. So again, in the first mechanism, we have this hydroxyl and this carboxyl. So the first step is we deprotonate this hydrogen and then these electrons fall on the oxygen and we're left with this oxygen anion, which is very nucleophilic. And we also have this carbon, which is very electrophilic. So they can react where again, we nucleophilically attack forming a bond. And when we form this bond, we push these pi electrons up onto this oxygen, forming this tetrahedral intermediate. Then these electrons scooch back down, forming a double bond. When we do that, we break this bond and these electrons fall in this oxygen. And when we do that, we form this product. So again, drawing this a little neater, we're left with this product, this ester. So again, that's the first mechanism, hydroxyl with the carboxyl forming an ester. So again, the key idea is that we nucleophilically attack forming a bond represented by this bond. So when we nucleophilically attack forming a bond, we break a bond where these green electrons fall on this guy and we're left with this product. So again, we form a bond and we break a bond. So that's the first mechanism. The second mechanism involves a hydroxyl and a phosphoester. So again, this, it's the same first step. We deprotonate this hydrogen, these electrons fall on this guy, and we're left with this oxygen anion, which is very nucleophilic. This phosphate is very electrophilic, so they can react. We nucleophilically attack forming a bond. When we form a bond, we push these pi electrons up on this oxygen. When we do that, we form this trigonal bipyramidal intermediate. When we form this intermediate, then these electrons scooch back down, forming a double bond. And when we do that, we break this bond, and these electrons fall on this oxygen. When we do that, we form this product. So drawing this a little neater, we're left with our phosphodiester. So again, in this second mechanism, we have a hydroxyl reacting with a phosphoester, forming this phosphodiester. And again, it's the same idea. We nucleophilically attack forming a bond represented by this bond. So when we nucleophilically attack, we form a bond, and then we break a bond where these electrons fall on this guy, and we're left with this leaving group. So again, these are the two mechanisms, hydroxyl and carboxyl forming an ester, and hydroxyl and a phosphoester forming a phosphodiester. So for the rest of this video, we're gonna to refer to this mechanism as mechanism one, and we're gonna to refer to this mechanism as mechanism two. And these are the two mechanisms you need to know for lipid biochemistry. So again, these fatty acids are at the center of lipid biochemistry, and there are two types of backbones that we can attach these fatty acids. So the first type of backbone I wanna talk about is glycerol, this glycerol backbone. So what is this glycerol backbone? Well, you've probably heard of glycolysis where we take glucose molecules and we enter them through the pathway of glycolysis. However, when we form this particular intermediate, sometimes we can continue and finish glycolysis. However, other times and other circumstances, we can take this compound and we can use it to form glycerol, this glycerol backbone. So that's how we form this glycerol backbone. But why? Well, what do we do with this glycerol backbone? Well, we can take this glycerol backbone and add free fatty acids. How do we do that? Well, again, remember, we have a hydroxyl and a carboxyl. So remember that mechanism one, we can use that mechanism one to attach these. And again, we know how we do that. We nucleophilically attack forming a bond. And when we form a bond, we break a bond. These electrons fall on this guy. And when we do that, we form this product this monoglyceride. However, we don't stop there. We can also take the second hydroxyl and add a second free fatty acid through again that mechanism one, the same mechanism. When we do that, we form this diglyceride. 
However, we have a third hydroxyl, so we can add a third free fatty acid through, again, that same mechanism one. And then we form this triglyceride, this triglyceride. So this compound is called a triglyceride, or also sometimes it's called triisoglyceride. And this compound is the primary storage form of energy our bodies use. When our body wants to store excess energy, we store it in the form of this triglyceride. So we can see why this guy's called a backbone. It's a backbone because we attach free fatty acids to it. However, we can attach other compounds to this glycerol backbone. For example, we can take these two hydroxyl groups and add two free fatty acids through, again, that mechanism one. However, we can take this third hydroxyl group and add a phosphate through that mechanism two. So again, by now you're probably pretty aware of that mechanism one, and that's how we add free fatty acids to these two hydroxyl groups. However, we can also add a phosphate to this hydroxyl group through that mechanism two. And again, remember that mechanism two, we attack forming a bond and then we break a bond. These electrons fall on this guy. So if we attach a phosphate to this guy and free fatty acids to these two hydroxyls, we're left with this compound, which is called a phospholipid, a phospholipid. And these phospholipids make up our plasma membrane, our semi-permeable plasma membrane, which is made up of these phospholipids, where this guy would represent this guy. So our, our plasma membrane is made out of many phospholipids. However, we don't stop at this particular compound, because what we can do is we can take this phosphate group and we can add other hydroxyl groups, other alcohols. So again, it doesn't matter what this R group is. This can be any chemical structure. That's not important. As long as this chemical structure has a hydroxyl group, we can add it to this phosphate through that mechanism too, where again, remember, we attack forming a bond, and then we break a bond. These electrons fall on this guy, and we would form this product, this phosphodiester. So it didn't matter what that R group was. As long as we had a hydroxyl, we could add it. So here are different compounds you'll see in biochemistry. You'll see choline, ethanolamine, and serine. So again, it doesn't matter what chemical structure we have. That's not important. It doesn't matter what this chemical structure is. As long as it has a hydroxyl group, we can add it. We can add it to this phosphate group. For example, this serine, we can add it to this phosphate group because we have a hydroxyl. So as long as we have a hydroxyl, we can add it, again, through that mechanism too, where again, we attack forming a bond and then we break a bond. These electrons fall on this guy. And when we do that, we would form this compound, this phosphatidylserine, where phosphatidyl refers to this group. And then again, the serine refers to whichever compound we added. So we added a serine. So therefore, it's phosphatidylserine. So again, this is another phospholipid that again makes up our plasma membrane. However, instead of adding a phosphate to this third hydroxyl group, we can also add a carbohydrate to this third hydroxyl group, where again, we would essentially form a bond and we would break a bond. And when we do that, we'd form this product, this glycerol glycolipid, this glycerol glycolipid. However, if I, some of you I know are gonna be really curious and wanna know the mechanism, so quickly going over the mechanism, the first step is we take this hydroxyl group and we turn it into a better leaving group. So we essentially add a chemical structure to make this guy better leaving group. The next step is now this guy can act as a leaving group. So essentially these lone pairs of electrons scooch down forming a double bond. And when that happens, we break this bond. So when this bond is broken, these electrons fall on this guy. And now this guy can act as a leaving group. And when we do that, we form this intermediate. So this intermediate has a very electrophilic carbon. So now this nucleophilic oxygen can nucleophilically attack this electrophilic carbon, when we do that, we form a bond. When we form a bond, we push these pi electrons up onto this oxygen. And when we do that, we form this glycosidic linkage. So now we form our glycerol glycolipid, our glycerol glycolipid. However, we don't always stop there. We can add more carbohydrates through a very similar mechanism. So we can add more carbohydrates forming these different types of glycolipids. So depending on the types of carbohydrates you add determines the type of glycolipid you form, glycolipid. So now we can see there are many different types of glycerol-based backbone lipids, lots of different lipids that use these glycerol backbones. 
So that concludes the lipids that use these glycerol-based backbones, but what about the lipids that use these phingosine-based backbones? Well, what is a phingosine backbone and how do we create this phingosine? Where does it come from? So in previous videos, we've learned about glycolysis and the Krebs cycle, and we refer to these two pathways as central metabolism. However, what's important to realize is we can take this particular intermediate of glycolysis to biosynthesize the serine amino acid. And we can take this acetyl-CoA molecule to go through a pathway referred to as fatty acid synthesis to biosynthesize these free fatty acids. Now what we can do is we can react a free fatty acid with the serine amino acid to form this phingosine backbone. So that's how we biosynthesize this phingosine backbone. However, why do we biosynthesize this phingosine backbone? What do we do with it? Well, this phingosine can act as a backbone to add these free fatty acids. And specifically what happens is we take this particular amine group to add a free fatty acid. And we do that through that exact same mechanism one, that exact same mechanism. The only difference is instead of a hydroxyl group, we have an amine group. However, this amine group can act as a nucleophile. So it can nucleophilically attack this carbon forming a bond. And when we form a bond, we break a bond and these electrons fall on this guy. And when we do that, we form this product, the ceramide. So again, the idea is we take this nitrogen and we nucleophilically attack forming a bond with this carbon. That's represented by this bond. And when we do that, we break a bond, these electrons fall on this guy. But the point is we form this ceramide compound. And this ceramide compound is extremely important. Our cells use the ceramide compound to produce a lot of very important lipids. For example, usually what we do is we take this head group, this hydroxyl group, which we refer to as the head group, and we use it to add a phosphate group. And again, we know this mechanism. This is through that mechanism too, where again, we attack forming a bond. When we form a bond, we break a bond. These electrons fall on this guy. When we do that, we form this phosphorylated ceramide. Now, once we form this phosphorylated ceramide, now what we can do is we can add other hydroxyl groups. So again, it doesn't matter what this chemical structure is. As long as it has a hydroxyl group, we can add it. And again, we add it through that mechanism too. Where again, we nucleophilically attack forming a bond. And when we form a bond, we break a bond. These electrons fall on this guy. When we do that, we form this phosphodiester. So it doesn't matter what that R group was. This could literally be any chemical structure you can think of. As long as it has a hydroxyl group, we can add it. For example, here are a couple common alcohols you'll see. Again, these, these are hydroxyl. So any compound with a hydroxyl, it's an alcohol. So these are the common hydro uh, alcohols you'll see in lipid biochemistry. Choline, ethanolamine, serine, and other generic alcohols. So again, it doesn't matter what the chemical structure is. As long as it has a hydroxyl, you can add it. For example, we can add this choline. How? Again, it doesn't matter what this side of the compound is. As long as a hydroxyl, we can add it through that mechanism too. Again, we attack forming a bond. When we form a bond, we break a bond. These electrons fall on this guy. And if we were to do that, we would form this compound. So we refer to this compound as sphingomyelin. So this compound is extremely important to build the myelin sheets in our neurons. So we build this sphingomyelin from this ceramide compound, which is extremely important, which again came from this phingosine backbone. So we refer to this as the phospho head group, which we added to this hydroxyl group, which again is referred to as the hydroxyl head group. So we can add lots of compounds to this hydroxyl head group. Not just this phospho head group, but we can add lots of compounds to this hydroxyl head group. For example, we can also add carbohydrates to this hydroxyl head group. Again, through that same mechanism we learned before. Again, we know this hydroxyl is a bad leaving group. However, we can add a chemical structure to it, turning this oxygen into a better leaving group. So now it can act as a leaving group where these lone pairs of electrons scooch down, forming a double bond. And when we do that, we break this bond and these electrons fall on this guy. So then this guy acts as a leaving group. Again, we break this bond, so this guy acts as a leaving group. And when we do that, we form this compound. And again, we already explained how this carbon is electrophilic, so this hydroxyl is nucleophilic, so we can attack. We can nucleophilically attack, forming a bond, pushing these pi electrons up onto this oxygen. And when we do that, we form this glycosidic linkage. So when we add one carbohydrate, to the ceramide. So when we take ceramide and we use its head group to add one carbohydrate, we form a cerebroside. 
So this is a cerebroside, a, a cere ceramide with one carbohydrate. However, we can also add more carbohydrates. We can add many carbohydrates. So when we add many carbohydrates, we form a gangliocide. And I remember this is a gangliocide because it has a gang of carbohydrates. We have many carbohydrates, a gang of carbohydrates. And specifically, you'll see with this carbohydrate, this sialic acid added for it to form this gangliocide. However, the point is, is that this is a sphingosine backbone. And we can take this specific amine group and add a free fatty acid. And when we add a free fatty acid to this particular amine group, we form this ceramide compound. And again, we can use the ceramide compound and add lots of different types of compounds to this hydroxyl head group. For example, if we add a phospho head group, we form this compound. If we add one carbohydrate, we form a cerebroside. If we add many carbohydrates, we form a gangliocide. So we can see how the ceramide is used to form lots of different compounds. But again, they all stem from this sphingosine backbone. So that concludes the lecture on glycerol-based backbones and sphingosine backbones. However, there is one last category. So again, we know this is glycolysis and this is the Krebs cycle. Collectively, these two pathways are referred to as central metabolism. However, what's important to realize is we can take these two carbons in acetyl-CoA to biosynthesize this HMG-CoA. Now, once we form this HMG-CoA, we can use it to form this five carbon compound, or we could use it to form this five carbon compound. However, what's important to realize is that these five carbon compounds are kind of like building blocks. They're kind of like Legos, like carbon Legos that our cells use to biosynthesize larger compounds, specifically larger lipids. For example, we can take two of these five carbon unit building blocks to build a 10 carbon unit building block. Now that we form this 10 carbon compound, we react it with another five carbon compound to form a 15 carbon compound. We react two of those 15 carbon compounds to form this 30 carbon squalene compound. Now when we form this lipid squalene, realize we have free rotation among some of these bonds. So we can distort and get in a very specific conformation to react with itself to form this lanasterol, which can then go through more chemical modifications to form cholesterol. So realize an important implication. As long as we have glucose molecules, we can go through glycolysis, then enter to form acetyl-CoA, to then form HMG-CoA, to then form these five carbon units, to then form cholesterol. So we can take glucose to biosynthesize cholesterol, which is a lipid, an extremely important lipid. So once we form cholesterol, we can use it to form lots of important compounds. For example, cholesterol can enter the, li the liver to form these bile salts, which is important for fat digestion and emulsification. We can also take cholesterol with some help from electromagnetic radiation, the liver and kidney, we can form different forms of vitamin D, which is a vitamin, which is a hormone. Also, we can take cholesterol to do some chemical modifications to go through the, the testes to form testosterone, or can go through the ovaries to form estradiol, or can enter into different parts of the, the adrenal cortex to form different hormones like cortisol or aldosterone. So we can see this cholesterol is extremely important. So this cholesterol is another type of lipid because any compound that's hydrophobic is a lipid by definition. So this is kind of like the third category of lipids. And again, so that's how you biosynthesize cholesterol. And these are some of the chemical pathways that cholesterol enters into. And it's, it's why cholesterol is so important because it's used to form vitamins and hormones and is used to emulsify and, and absorb fat.